If ESPN had been around, I mean, we'd been the best, the best story they'd ever had. Matt Jacksonville. Reflections of a proud history hang high. This is the story of a team. Jacksonville who and you know, nobody had ever heard of us. Otis Gilmore was our powerhouse, and we were making national news, Jacksonville, Florida. That would unite a divided city. This was just out of nowhere. I mean, you get three seven-footers and, and Fun Wedekin and Greg Nelson, and you, all of a sudden you got a team that can contend for the national championship. And the tip is over to Jacksonville. Morgan breaks and hits the end. And captivate a country. Artis Gilmore came out with that Alfro, and it literally scared you to death. It was the, the day that Jacksonville stood still. That probably put Jacksonville on the map. Stepping in, Artis Gilmore was jumping in. Tonight, the story of the Jacksonville Dolphins, Day in the Sun. Hello, I'm Dan Hicken. So much has changed since the years 1969 and 1970. Gas was about 25 cents a gallon back then. Neil Armstrong was the first human being to ever set foot on the moon. The Beatles were telling us to let it be and Simon and Garfunkel were taking that bridge over troubled waters. One thing hasn't changed since 1970, however. 36 years ago, the JU Dolphins were playing their home games right here in Swisher Gym, the very same gym they still call home. Back then, kids were trying to make sense of Vietnam, and after Woodstock would rather make love, not war. But here on the Oak Shroud at Arlington campus, a basketball team came together from different parts of the country and different cultures with one common goal. That was to win basketball games and win them big. The nation would come to know them as a Cinderella story, but the real story may be a city on a troubled river and a team that would lift up its segregated soul and make winners out of all of them. Now, in their own words, they tell their story of a day in the sun. 1969, Broadway Joe, the Miracle Mets, and Vietnam. They called us a mod squad. I mean, we had yeah. long hair and, yeah. and no curfews, you know. Consolidation makes Jacksonville the largest city in the free world, the bold new city of the South. But turning the corner isn't easy. This was really two cities. There was a wealthy city and a poor city. There was a white city and a black city. And this was a backdrop that African Americans were very aware of and most whites were not. And that was a time of change. Uh, some of it good and some of it not all that good. We had, uh, like you mentioned, uh, the race riot. A shooting in front of a store on Florida Avenue draws angry blacks and police to the streets on Halloween. The people uh, torched the grocery store. The city is falling apart again because of racial strife. All hell broke loose. But on a small college campus nestled in Arlington, something magical is coming together. I think what was happening on that JU campus is much more significant than people realize. The JU opened up something for black-white relationships. Several things happened that were really important. Uh, uh, Chipper Dublin kind of started things off. Chip was from New York City. He was extremely personal. Everybody loved him and met him. He had a great big smile. When Chipper first came down, uh, we'd go in to eat somewhere and they said, well, y'all can eat here, but he has to eat in the kitchen. We said, well, we'll all eat in the kitchen. I want to say this, I remember one time we, there were still a lot of Southern guys on the team uh -huh. and we were at a restaurant, I'll never forget this. And uh, we'd ordered the drinks. When the drinks came, and uh, one guy who was an outspoken guy, but uh -huh. a good guy, had ordered Coke. Chip had ordered milk. Uh -huh. Well, the waiter put it down. He put Chip on the Coke and the other guy on the milk. But Chip drank about two swallows out of the Coke. And the guy says, hey, what, what happened to my Coke? So Chip said, oh, I think I've got it. So uh -huh. he passed it over. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know. So they were the first time, you know, right. this is stop. Right. Is a guy going to drink the Coke, right. you know, after the black man drinking right. the Coke? Right. You know, that was the first. And he did. We, we had a great relationship. Uh, we all lived in a dorm in the same, on the same floor. I was you know, very good friends with Pembroke and, and Artis. And, and uh, Artis and I were teammates in some of the games, or, or roommates, I'm sorry. Out in, out in Hawaii, we were roommates. I didn't see color. A team that didn't see color begins to forge a legend. The city was hungry for something exciting. A legend as high as Jacksonville's tallest building in 1969. 
the Joe Six Pack or whatever, just didn't have a chance to really get excited about anything until J.U. and artists came uh, came along and we they started to say, hey, we're about to ring the bell of the greatest team in the whole United States. I saw a lady one time walk into a post in, a, in, a, in the uh, airport lobby. She's got two bags like this. She's walking down the lobby and she sees artists and she's turning around like this. And she runs into this post and falls down and artists goes over and picks her up. But she couldn't believe how big this guy was. You couldn't believe it. A year earlier, JU assistant Tom Wasden would take his head coach Joe Williams on a recruiting trip that would change Jacksonville history. We had a player that we were recruiting, Ernie Fleming. And he was at, uh, up at Gardner Webb. And Ernie wrote Tom a letter, wrote both of us a letter, but it said basically, um, you all were really nice to me when I was in, uh, when you recruit me in uh, high school. And I've got good grades, and I'd like to transfer at the end of my freshman season to JU. There's a three page letter, and in the bottom he said, P.S., I'd also like to bring my roommate. My friend is seven foot two, Artis Gilmore. And so that got our attention. So we went up there. Mm -hmm. And by the time we were in there three or four minutes. And I was up cheering, shouting myself. <laughs> you know, artists was blocking shots all yeah. over the place. So yeah. uh, that's kind of how we got started. Artist Gilmore, seven foot two, a soft spoken giant from a small town in Florida. Well, Chipley, Florida started off in Chipley. JU happened to be it because it was closer to home. Parents were getting a little older. It gave me an opportunity to be near them, and uh, as well as younger brothers and sisters. It was the piece of the puzzle we needed. You bring a guy like Artis in, you no longer question who the lead guy is. Gilmore's impact is instant. Glad he was on my side. He's the biggest man I'd ever met to that, at that point in my life. Yeah. He was just absolutely huge. Uh -huh. And then go up to Richmond. Artis was a, was a freak to these people. They, they never, never seen anybody jump as high as this guy, as, as trim as he is and as big as he is. And they up there yelling dunk it before the game when you couldn't dunk. Uh -huh. So finally Joe went on time told him, said, just throw one down. He jumps up and throws it down backwards like this and rattles the boards. And those people went crazy and Jay, you had to start the game off with two technical fouls against them for doing that. Actually, Jacksonville kind of exploded when they got Gilmore. And his play puts the JU Dolphins on the basketball map. From the first time this stylish bunch hit the floor, they know. Back then you were allowed to uh, have scrimmages, uh -huh. and Davidson came in here with Mike Malloy and, and was highly rated, and we beat them by 30 in a scrimmage at Swisher, and uh -huh. Gene Pullen was in there. From then on, the rest of the year, I'm writing that J.U. has a chance to win the national championship. Everybody's Everybody's laughing, laughing at me. Yeah. J.U. becomes the first team ever to average more than 100 points a game in a season coming off its most lopsided win, a 65-point victory over Biscayne. JU hosts Georgetown in a game that would become another turning point in this Cinderella season. My role was to take whoever was the number one player on the other team and guard him. Yeah, they had a kid by the name of uh, Arthur White. Two minutes before halftime, he had, he had maybe one bucket or two, and he got frustrated. And I'm you know, elbowing him and you know, kind of bugging him a little bit, and he just turns around and hits me. Levins retaliated and I got caught in the middle and a guy caught me and, and split my eye. So punches were being thrown. Oh yeah. And uh, so at that point the fans came on the on the on the floor. And of course I found the artist right away and got him on the bench and protected him. <laughs> <laughs> and Georgetown pulls their team off the floor and of course they lose the game. That game would be the last at Swisher Gym that season. When we started winning and we moved to the Coliseum, the Coliseum was a big move. <laughs> By Christmas, Jacksonville is in the top 10, and the Dolphins are having a good time. Pembroke would say, Jacksonville had a rooster. And they put him on the fence, and he crowed for the Dolphins, and he had good sense. I had a ho. Oh, oh, what a team. Jacksonville's got a team. It'll be with you for the rest of your life. Yeah. <laughs> Has been. The Dolphins crow their way to 13 straight wins at the start of the season. Florida State would end the streak. J.U. though bounces back with 10 straight wins, including a victory over the Knolls, a game billed as the biggest ever in Florida. 
they scout tickets for the game. We're talking about 69 and 70 basketball. They were scalping tickets for the game. The Dolphins end the season 23 and one, the fourth ranked team in the country and on the doorstep to the big dance. I remember Joe Williams sitting and said, we, we, we're hoping, we're sitting by the phone hoping that we're gonna receive a bid. Was there concern that you might not get a bid? I think there was. Well, we came back from beating Kentucky. Next, the team energizes a city. There were 30,000 people at the airport and on the highway. They held up air traffic for eight hours. The team had really had captivated the, the city. The Joe Six Pack or whatever, just didn't have a chance to really get excited about anything until J.U. and Artis came, uh, came along. <laughs> The tournament run begins with a trip to Dayton, Ohio in a first round matchup with Western Kentucky. The game is JU's first ever on national television. When we went up to play Western Kentucky, uh, uh, they had signs on their board, Jacksonville who, and you know, nobody had ever heard of us. And I don't think we really were aware of what we were running into. And actually once the game started, we realized we ran into a buzzsaw. Artist Gilmore came out with that Alfro, and it literally scared you to death. They were up like, like 10 at halftime, somebody said they're not this good. I said, you watch me, I'll blow them away, which they did. Mm -hmm. Then they go to UC, then they go to Columbus, Ohio. They play, they play Iowa, downtown, Freddie Brown and those guys. Artists start out with seven minutes to go. I'm on the bench and suddenly, you know, I'm coaching them, coaching Pembroke. Right. Pembroke, listen, man, you know, you really have to make this thing happen. You've got to go. Right. And uh, Pembroke turns and says, well, I guess so. I had the ball, they doubled me, I hit Weddicking. He shot a jump shot from about, would the NBA or would be a college three now, okay. hit the front of the rim, Burroughs tipped it in. And after I made the tip in, I really didn't know the game was over. The last second tip in carries Jacksonville to the regional final against the number one ranked team in the country, the Kentucky Wildcats. Personally, I think most of us wanted that game more than any game. They were the more traditional team, and here were, we were the mod squad. Mm -hmm. You know, we had all this bat band and robin, and we had, we had, you know, we would win, warm up to Sweet Georgia Brown. And Artist Gilmore blocks a late rally by the Wildcats. It's amazing. You know, I've scored over 25,000 points yeah. in the NBA and, and professional level, and rebounds very similar, and block shots. I still remember the score, 106 to 100 in the Kentucky game. And little J.U. makes it to the Final Four in a matchup not even Sports Illustrated could imagine. So when J.U. manages to knock off uh, Kentucky, they had done something. And when we came home, there was such a, uh, a crowd. There were 30,000 people at the airport and on the highway. They held up air traffic for eight hours. It's, it's almost... Uh, um, electric when you think about what happened. I think it was electric at the time because it brought the community together as I have never seen this community come together. It galvanized the city and the community as a whole. The team then quickly dispatches a Bob Lanier-less St. Bonaventure squad to set up the David and Goliath matchup in the finals. When you think about it, a little school from the bold new city of the South going to the Nationals to play against a powerhouse, a dynasty like UCLA. Hey, man, you got to, it was something. We were really proud. We lived in uh, apartments outside of uh, JU. We hauled out the biggest TV that you could buy probably at the time, big piece of furniture, console. It, heavy, heavy, heavy. Every game, out it came out of the house, out onto the patio. When we were playing our games, you could go out on the streets and there wasn't a car on the, on the road. So it was the, the day that Jacksonville stood still. We were really excited about playing in uh -huh. that game. Little Jacksonville University up against mighty UCLA and the legendary coach John Wooden. That was a different level. We knew about UCLA. Mm -hmm. We knew about um, their run mm -hmm. uh, as, as champions the nation's tallest team against one of the country's quickest. Sidney Witts was the powerhouse then, but Artis Gilmore was our powerhouse and we were making national news, Jacksonville, Florida. The national championship matched Jacksonville against defending titleist UCLA. Go, go. Here we go. The Cinderella team, the unknown against the 
defending national champs, UCLA. And the tip is over to Jacksonville. Morgan breaks and hits the open. The confident Dolphins jumped to a nine-point lead early, but the Bruins wouldn't go away. I remember looking looking at the bench and seeing John Wooden, and and he's just calm as he can be, just like, oh well, we're gonna come back. And he just, it's like he knew. And they just, they just kept coming and kept coming and kept coming. Uh, I think, to me, if I was to call it, I think it was, a, it was an issue of adjustments that. Um, they adjusted well, we didn't adjust. We gotta go to the boards when Art gets the ball. UCLA smothers Artis Gilmore on both ends of the floor. When Wicks is blocking the shot, when it's goaltending, but they're not calling it. I mean, it's in my feeble eyes, you know. <laughs> Wicks comes down, and you can't dunk. Right. And Artis is standing in front of the basket, and Wicks just comes down and jumps right over the top of him and slams it down through the basket. He was sort of flabbergasted, he was sort of intimidated, as you'd say, by that. UCLA also made a home at the free throw line. We haven't shot one yet. We haven't shot a foul. It's a game statistic still under debate. Did you get five guys in striped shirts out there that's going to stop UCLA's seven national championship winning streak? you got to be nuts. The only time in the history of my whole life that I didn't go to the free throw line. It may sound like sour grace, but it's not. But JU stands tall in defeat as UCLA wins another championship. Even though they lose, the city demonstrated how proud the city was. And they're willing to go to the airport and, and to parade around and really celebrate what happened and say, hey, we're coming home to a city that loves you. One of my proudest moments. And they took that attitude. It was not easy to take. The night they lost to UCLA. Next, JU returns home champions. And they must have been 10 deep all the way to the airport on the side of the road. Unbelievable. I, I remember looking looking at the bench and seeing John Wooden and, and we're up by you know, 15, 16 points and, and he's just calm as he can be, just like, oh well, we're gonna come back. And he just, it's like he knew. 36 years later, the players still believe they could have, maybe should have won. Oh, we were shocked, and we believed to this day if we played them five times, we'd beat them four. I think that we believed that we were probably a better team man for man. The question is, well, you guys didn't win it, but right. uh, who remember who comes in second? Apparently, the city remembered, and that's something this college team will never forget. The night they they lost to UCLA, they came, we came back in on the plane. And and they must have been 10 deep all the way to the airport on the side of the road. Unbelievable. And if ESPN had been around, I mean, we'd been the best, story. the best story they'd ever had. Next, the winning continues. I like to think of this group of young men as being far beyond just basketball. Unless you were there, you probably don't know just how good this team was. That Rex Morgan made all 10 of his field goal attempts against Kentucky in the tourney. Or that Artis Gilmore averaged, averaged more than 20 rebounds a game in his career at JU. Or that this was the first team in NCAA history to score more than 100 points a game. And that was without a shot clock or a three-point line. Amazing. But what was even more amazing was for those couple of hours when this team played, JU green was the only color people saw. And that's a credit to Gilmore, Burroughs, Morgan, McIntyre, Williams, and the rest. For them, memories of a lifetime. But it's also something more. It was a camaraderie of competition that pushed each on in their professional lives. I like to think of this group of young men as being far beyond just basketball. And all you have to do is to see the success in their lives and realize what a difference they have made to see that it, people, one person can make a difference. In this case, here was a team that could make a difference. Again, the reason we were so competitive, everybody believed, believed they were a winner. And I think it carried on after basketball. It's helped build my character, thanks to them. Because if it had not been for them, it would be no me. And, uh, and I really appreciate that.
playing with that team and, and seeing, you know, every one of those kids, every one of the guys on that team graduated. So, I mean, we did everything the right way, even though people didn't think so. The team did so well, and we had the support of the community, and, and, and the businessmen in the community certainly helped us once we got out to establish ourselves in businesses. The very next season, the miracle run was over. Joe Williams had already left for a better paying job at Furman. Rex Morgan was on to the NBA. And JU lost in the first round of the tournament to Western Kentucky. They've only been back three times. But the city on the Trouble River has grown up quite a bit since. We've attracted the NFL, the NCAA tournament, and yes, even a Super Bowl. Everywhere you look on the first coast, there are signs of growth and a thriving city. Now there's no way to quantify exactly how much this team helped unify the city, but make no mistake, the Cinderella story was an important chapter to the bold new city of the South. <laughs>